Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to welcome you to this webinar jointly organized by the Singapore Business Federation and the Smart Cities Network. I am Jeffrey from the Singapore Business Federation, and I will be your host and moderator for today's virtual event. Whether you are a large corporate or an SME, into ICT, sustainable development, infrastructure, or any other related industry, or interested in the Malaysian market, we hope that through this webinar, you will learn more about the smart cities opportunities in Malaysia. To provide some context on the topic of smart cities, as population growth surges in urban areas around the world, cities inevitably face increasing infrastructure needs to deliver a better quality of life. The term smart city is a hot topic these days, and there are many Singapore companies which are involved in various aspects of the sector. Singapore has been determined to be the number one ranked city in the Smart City Index 2020, developed by the Swiss Institute for Management Development. Hence, Singapore companies have much expertise that we could bring to the rest of ASEAN. We have an exciting lineup of speakers for you today to cover this topic. Over the next one and a half hours, we'll be hearing from four esteemed speakers. Our first speaker, Ms. Maimuna Jaffa, Director of Technology and Innovation in Iskanda Regional Development Authority, will be sharing about smart cities and the potential collaboration opportunities in Johor. Following which, we have Mr. Tony Yeo, CEO of Digital Penang, who will be sharing about investment and collaboration opportunities with Digital Penang. Our third speaker is Ms. Go Siok May, CEO of Grafico and Executive Director of United Cities. She will be sharing on how Singapore companies can better engage Malaysian stakeholders. Lastly, we have Mr. BK Singha, Founder and Director of Habitat and Viral and Council Member of Malaysian Green Building Council. BK will be sharing his experience regarding food security in Malaysia. Thereafter, we will have a Q&A com panel discussion segment at about 4.05 p.m. As such, you should ask all your questions via the Zoom Q&A function during any part of the webinar. If you have questions on smart cities projects in Malaysia or are interested to look for collaborative partners in Malaysia, please email my colleague Zichuan for our complimentary business consultation, consultation session by SPF and SSEN. To kick off this event, I would like to invite Ms. Maimuna Jaffa, Director of Technology and Innovation in the Iskandar Regional Development Authority. Maimuna also leads the Smart City Iskandar Malaysia team as the Chief Smart City Officer for Johor Bahru in the ASEAN Smart City Network Program Alliances. She is also the Vice Chairman for the Malaysia Green Building Council Southern Chapter 2021. Maimuna speaks at various national and international conferences and summits on the topic of sustainable and smart cities. Today, she will be sharing on smart cities ecosystem, how such projects in Malaysia are prioritized, and the challenges and solutions to delivering these projects. Maimuna, please. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I hope everyone is in the best health. So my name is Maimuna Jaffa, and as, as mentioned just now, I lead the technology and innovation in Iskandar Regional Development Authority, uh, the organization. So basically, in my presentation today, I will cover and share with all of you on Malaysia's smart city framework and, and also some of our effort in the smart city projects since 2012. And uh, as part of the program, we have actually uh, embarked on what we call Smart City 101 training. Uh, and I will end up this presentation by sharing with all of you the common challenges in Malaysia cities and perhaps some of the possible projects and a few recipes for partnership with cities in Malaysia. So as you can see, um, why Malaysia is actually uh, interested in looking at this uh, smart city. So basically, as you know, Malaysia also um, have challenge in rapid urbanization. And it is envisaged that by year 2030, we will have about 36.1 million. So currently we are about 32.7 million. 
And again, uh, I think the numbers is quite uh, similar to all cities in, in the world. Nearly 78% of Malaysia total population will live in urban areas. So like Kuala Lumpur, uh, you have uh, Petaling Jaya, we have uh, Penang, Georgetown, as well as Johor Bahru. And at the same time, uh, we also understand that uh, having limitation in resources again uh, is such a gain if we can actually embark in a smart cities uh, journey. And, and this will also include inter-agencies enforcement, improve of public services for enhanced quality of life. So again, uh, earlier uh, this year or late last year, um, Malaysia has actually launched its digital transformation plan that I think one of the target is looking at end-to-end -end government online services up to 85% and about 80% of government data should be on cloud. And thirdly, the most important reason why we embark in smart cities and why actually Iskandar Malaysia is looking at this, we need to be competitive. So in order to make sure that our economic growth is competitive, again, with city like Singapore, country like Singapore, and, and also the upcoming digital business trend, we don't want to be left behind. So there is... Uh, there are actually many uh, funding allocated for investment in technology and innovation and in the digital uh, transformation plan is also been earmarked that by year 2025, 22.6% of digital uh, economy should contribute to Malaysia's GDP. And of course, everybody is talking about industrial uh, revolution 4.0 and there are many incentives that Malaysia has uh, put in to ensure that uh, we can actually achieve our target. So let me introduce a little bit on what Smart City Malaysia framework is all about. So in year 2019, uh, our Ministry of Housing and um, Local uh, Government has actually uh, develop what we call Malaysia Smart City Framework launched on 24th September with actually uh, seven pillars. We look at uh, economy, living, environment, people, governance, uh, infrastructure, as well as uh, mobility. So on top of that, uh, there are also certain, uh, four cities uh, that have been identified to become the pilot. Kuala Lumpur, Kuching, Kota Kinabalu, and the first one is actually Johor Bahru. And this is where I'm actually coming from. And we are also four of the 26 cities in the ASEAN Smart Cities Framework. And Malaysia Smart City Framework, actually, uh, the definition is to see how ICT technology can actually improve quality of life and make our lifestyle easier. And this is actually aligned as well to the 17 sustainable development goals. And uh, in order to uh, accelerate or assist cities in uh, embarking in the smart city journey, Malaysia has also looked at the smart city standards. So currently there is actually a task force team uh, led by our planning uh, agency, which is Plan Malaysia, which look at how we can actually standardize some of the smart city standards as well as indicator. And the standards are actually being derived from ISO 37122, but not all can actually, actually be adapted. So if you look at the numbers, uh, we can safely say that there are 12 indicators that we can totally adopt. 42 indicators that requires uh, modification and about 26 that may be not applicable. So I think Malaysia have our own culture, our own of uh, uh, way of doing things. So maybe at this point, uh, we cannot actually uh, bring everything into uh, Malaysia in, in Malaysia context. So uh, for people who are not familiar, so in year 2012, uh, Iskandar Malaysia Smart City actually was launched and we have actually developed this framework. 
and and it covers six dimension and four important enabler or ecosystem uh, again same like malaysia smart city framework it covers economy governance environment living mobility and people but infrastructure we put it as our enabler or important ecosystem because without infrastructure hardware software and data i don't think we can actually uh, go further uh, into this smart city Second, we are talking about data analytics. We are talking about how we want to collect data from this smart city uh, component and, and how this data can actually be uh, collect, integrate and also analyze for an informed decision. The third ecosystem that uh, we have put in our smart city Iskandar Major framework is actually looking at how uh, government, especially uh, local authorities or city municipalities should become the driver for this smart city. And lastly, we talk about private driven smart solution. And I guess this will be all of you to see how we can actually partner with uh, city government uh, to enhance uh, quality of life and actually do this together with us. So for those who are not familiar with Iskandar Malaysia, we are actually nearly 45 minutes. I guess most of you know where Iskandar Malaysia is or is, uh, it is at the moment. But maybe you don't know that in Iskandar Malaysia, there are actually five local planning authorities. So we have Bandaraya Johor Bahru, we have Bandaraya Iskandar Putri, we have the Bandaraya Pasir Gudang. Yes, Bandaraya Pasir Gudang has actually received its status of Bandaraya or city uh, end of last year. And then we have Kulai as well as we have Pontian. So uh, I can say that uh, Iskandar Malaysia is an economic uh, development uh, corridor. Uh, we were established in year uh, 2006. So this year we are 15 years and we are about three times bigger than Singapore. So uh, what have we done so far since 2012? So when we first started in 2012, we understand that for a city to become a smart city, we need to actually to become a sustainable city first. So when we first started 2012, we look mostly at sustainable projects. So we talk about renewable energy, we talk about perhaps uh, uh, EV cars. So those are actually what we call low hanging fruit that we can start uh, in smart city project. And those are the projects that we count as a beginner level project. This is how we talk to our local authorities so that they understand that embarking on a smart city journey, you need to make sure that your city is sustainable. And after that, we look at how we can optimize technology to uh, further enhance our sustainability and in the third phase, then we talk about how smart city project should be connected to what we call our big data platform, whereby uh, we have actually uh, currently uh, developing our Iskandar Malaysia Urban Observatory. And this will be a center where we analyze data, we collect data, we coordinate and integrate. So other projects, uh, again, uh, look at enhancement of river. I think most of you know the condition of rivers in, in Johor Bahru uh, area. So we are looking at river monitoring. We are also enhancing our uh, uh, bus rapid transit. So currently we are in design stage. So we will embed some intelligent, intelligent uh, transportation component in our IMBRT. And the project is um, planned to be completed in year 2023. And at the same time, to actually support uh, RMBRT, to support RTS and, you know, uh, the dual tracking KTM and other logistic related uh, transportation, we have actually worked with uh, uh, UK government to actually develop what we call smart integrated mobility management system. So we hope that this system will enable us 
or enable uh, state government to actually monitor all public transportation in Johor, as well as we will actually utilize data, manage data as an evidence-based urban and transportation planning. And, and lastly, one of the projects that I want to mention here is on Smart City uh, Action Plan together with my five local authorities. And um, when we talk about uh, working with uh, local government uh, on top of our relationship with our five local authorities in driving smart city, uh, I just want to share with you some of the key projects uh, from the um, four cities in the ASCN platform, uh, which is Kuala Lumpur. Of course, we have Kota Kinabalu. We also have Kuching. So Johor Bahru, uh, will focus on what I mentioned just now, Urban Observatory. And the second project is actually working on um, uh, river or uh, urban water management, which include river, water supply, water distribution, and so forth. So the other three cities, for example, Kuala Lumpur also look at urban observatory. Kota Kinabalu look at integrated solid waste management and Kuching look at, looks at integrated flight uh, management uh, system. So uh, our experience working with cities in Malaysia uh, really enhanced when we started to do this Smart City one-on-one -on -one program. So in this program, there are about 47 participants with about 11 to 12 cities in Malaysia. And this is actually a program with Smart Cities Network and there are three modules. And the way that we conduct uh, this program is we help them to define the urban challenge, prioritize project, develop procurement paper, and develop uh, concept paper. So these are some of the uh, highlights where Kuala Lumpur again talks about urban of the three, Skanda Putri on smart traffic light, Majlis Daerah Labis and Mersin talks about perhaps uh, smart tourism platform or tourism apps. So I just want to share, I think I have another two or three slides before I end. I just want to share with you our experience working with the city. So basically, there are some common urban challenges faced by cities in Malaysia. First, we talk about network and infrastructure, uh, the readiness, uh, the stability, the affordability and so forth. Second is traffic management. I guess with the limited public transportation, I think uh, some more cities need to look at how they can actually manage traffic, especially deploying smart traffic light. Third is waste management. Again, I think Malaysian cities actually spend a lot of money uh, managing waste. So we are looking at how waste can be produced into perhaps energy or waste to well and so forth. Uh, fourth is economic regeneration, how digital uh, entrepreneurship, online businesses can actually generate economy. Fourth one is talking about efficient government delivery system. I think I mentioned just now, 85% uh, by year 2030 should be uh, in um, uh, using e-government services. And lastly, of course, environmental uh, related monitoring and enforcement. I mean, this is something that we are looking at so that we can join and force, we can actually manage our resources and so forth. So what would be our, the, their challenges? I guess uh, there are four important challenges. Again, infrastructure readiness. Uh, there are certain policy actually disjointed, uh, so requires uh, joint collaboration between agencies. Third is actually mindset change and readiness of resources. Sometimes uh, the mayor or the president are not ready to embark on this new technology and innovation. And lastly, again, I put that as limited funding. But actually, when we talk about funding challenges, there are other indirect um, uh, methods that related to funding because they are not ready to provide those funding because they don't understand. They don't understand the full range of options available, solution available out there to resolve their urban challenge. Second, they still don't understand the advantage and disadvantage of each solution. Thirdly, some areas of this digital infrastructure or technology remain untested or tested only at limited capacity, though, so they are not confident to do this. And lastly, maybe the benefit of the selected solution has not been proven. 
So these are some of the funding challenges that I find that common between cities in Malaysia. So when we talk about funding, there are also six possibility funding. One, of course, they find their own funding. Second, international grants. There are many grants actually um, uh, from countries uh, or NGO, uh, NGO or United Nations that actually solution provider can ask for, apply for. Thirdly is demonstration project. And this is something that uh, uh, good because some of my projects with uh, our local authority is actually through this demonstration project. So perhaps when they actually see the project, then after that, they can actually sign in for the real project to be done. Fourth, we talk about revenue sharing. This is PPP. So PPP can be a high intensity project like waste to energy and so forth. And, and lastly, we talk about financial arrangement deferred payment from CD. Again, this is a very uh, popular uh, way of financing to see that how third party developer can actually work together with the cities or with building uh, owner to actually develop uh, uh, deferred payment from saving. So I guess I want to end uh, my presentation sharing with you what is perhaps the recipe for partnership from Singapore business to uh, Iskandar Malaysia or to Malaysia. So one, we are always looking for the right partners, partners that can provide solution to the urban challenges. Second, again, we welcome demonstration project. I mentioned just now, some of us are not familiar with the solution that they have. Perhaps demonstration project can actually convince the mayor, the president that this is the right solution. And lastly, to make sure that project is self-sustained or sustainable, we need a win-win business model. Partners that can come up with the right business model can actually be a partner with our cities for projects that can be sustained in the long run. I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Back to you, Jeff. Thank you, Maimuna. Indeed, finding the right partners will be key to delivering a good smart city solution. Audiences watching this webinar, do type in your questions at any point of time during the webinar using the Q&A function in Zoom. Before we move on to our second speaker, we would like to find out more about our audiences today. We would like to invite you to take a very short poll on Zoom. May I have the poll questions launched, please? We would like to get your thoughts on the Malaysian markets and when you would intend to venture into Malaysia for project opportunities. The poll will be up for the next three minutes, so please fill it up at your convenience. Next, we are privileged to have our second speaker, Mr. Tony Yeo, CEO of Digital Penang, to share about the investment and collaboration opportunities with Digital Penang. Digital Penang is a government agency from the state of Penang, established to accelerate efforts to capture opportunities in the digital economy and promote a digitally engaged society. Tony will tell us more about Digital Penang's role in developing an innovative digital economy aligned to the Penang 2030 vision. He will also be sharing some collaboration opportunities for partners in Singapore to work with Digital Penang. Tony, over to you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, and also thank you to uh, Singapore Business Federation for the invitation to share with your members uh, about uh, Penang's uh, growth and development plans. Um, I'm going to probably just give a very high overview of the development plans from now to 2030 and beyond and what opportunities there are and what kind of uh, investment partners uh, and projects that we're looking at. Uh, I'll just give a brief overview of Penang. Uh, we are only the second smallest state in Malaysia, only 1,000 square kilometers, so slightly about 50% bigger than Singapore, but our population is uh, at 1.8 million and half the workforce, uh, pre predominantly are in manufacturing and tourism. Uh, obviously, uh, tourism is the most affected sector now, uh, but manufacturing has been doing quite well. 
Um, <clears throat> so, uh, as you know, the awards that we've won, and obviously many of you wouldn't have noted that we have noted for our F&B and street food, as well as Georgetown is recognized as a UNESCO uh, heritage site. Uh, also, uh, we have been recognized as one of the 10 dynamic industry clusters, uh, probably uh, an informally known as the Silicon Valley of uh, Malaysia. Uh, so for the last 200 years, I guess since uh, Penang was founded by uh, Sir Francis Light in 1786, uh, so in the early days, it was a port. So this is something like uh, probably uh, 30, 40 years before Singapore was founded. Uh, it was the first port city in the region. Uh, and, and for the longest time, uh, we were a great entrepreneur. Uh, in the region uh, until we lost the free port status in 1969. And then uh, in, at, during that time, uh, there was a shift in the industry structure and basically the free trade zone was set up in Bayan Lepas. For the last 60 years, this has been the key economic pillar of Penang. And obviously uh, we've been doing well, well in manufacturing, especially in high-tech e e as well as in manufacturing of medical devices. So seven of the top 10 medical device manufacturers, uh, people like B. Brown, Boston Scientific, they're all based in Penang. So going forward, uh, what is next for Penang, obviously, is to look at uh, what is the uh, next economic pillar beyond tourism as well as manufacturing. And so obviously, digital and the green economy is uh, something that uh, it, 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 it's an area that we need to extend ourselves into to capture opportunities into the future. Uh, as you can see from our economic uh, share of employment as well as uh, where the revenue comes from, it's almost 50-50 between services and manufacturing, and in services predominantly from tourism. Obviously, we need to shift gear into this digital era to move into industry 4.0 and into in digitalization, and therefore we need to look at uh, digital transformation into the future. Sorry, yeah, slides are going a bit too fast. Okay. So in the industry itself, there are 300 MSCs uh, in, the, in the state itself, uh, and they're supported by about 3,000 SMEs, mostly in manufacturing, in high-tech manufacturing itself. And in fact, some of the local manufacturers uh, have already listed themselves in Bursa. Seven out of the 10 top technology companies are listed in Bursa. Uh, the likes of Great Tech, Vitrox, Spectre Master, uh, UWC, all these guys are all listed in Bursa. And, and basically, they are supporting the ecosystem uh, for the MNC manufacturers. Uh, Penang has got a talent pool, obviously, and that's the reason why uh, it's attracted all these uh, companies and MNCs to invest in. Uh, we have got uh, public universities and private universities, as well as a supporting ecosystem of colleges and universities, as well as TVET. Uh, if you look at the development of Penang, uh, I think you could probably safely say that uh, you could predict where it's going to go, because if you're from Singapore, uh, it follows the same trajectory as Singapore. We have the same uh, challenges, the small land size, uh, small population, uh, a lot of constraints. And so you can roughly estimate and see where the future trajectory uh, can to go. We only have land and resources. Uh, basically, that's the, the, the only thing that we have. And so therefore, uh, you could simply say what the future would look like. And so based on that, you could project backwards and see uh, what, what should you be looking at in terms of the growth uh, of the land. So about two or three years ago, the chief minister came up with this vision of the 1930, which is a family-focused green smart state that inspires the nation under the themes of a, a livable environment. Obviously, with only 1.8 million and a thousand square kilometers, it's a very livable lifestyle environment. And unfortunately, it's attracted a lot of retirees uh, and it's, it's a, a lifestyle 
uh, choice uh, stay. Uh, and then to also to look at upgrading the economy, obviously, to get into a high income uh, state. Right? And then also to uh, basically to empower the citizenry in the participation of uh, the state policies. And then obviously to have a great infrastructure. Uh, so, uh, under this vision itself, and as mentioned by Kwan Mamuna earlier, the government at the federal level has come up with this plan called My Digital under the EPU Plan Malaysia. And roughly a lot of the objectives are very aligned with what we're trying to do at Digital Penang in terms of the transformation under the four pillars of governance, economy, community, and infrastructure. Uh, under the digital governance, this is very similar to, I guess, tough uh, fact in Singapore. Uh, and this is basically trying to coordinate digital initiatives within the government uh, in terms of service delivery to the public. Under the digital economy, so this is probably a very similar in the arrangement that we have is we have, uh, we have Enterprise Singapore, so we're probably like what we call Enterprise Penang. Uh, so it's more uh, outbound, local FME going outbound, so getting the local enterprise to go digital and go international. And we have a similar agency in Bestinang, which looks at like inbound, which is equivalent to your EDB. Uh, and so this is basically our role is more in terms of local enterprises, local startups, and then getting them to go outbound. Under the digital infrastructure, so this is very similar to your IMDA. Uh, at the federal level, this is equivalent to MCMC. Right? So basically, we are coordinating at the state level uh, some of these key initiatives to actually move towards the Penang 2030 edition. Uh, so in terms of the economic zones in Penang, uh, there are basically 10 industrial estates uh, in Penang. Nine of them are on the mainland, as you can see, and only one on the island. So the island is evolving towards a more a service oriented island and then the, the mainland is more the industrial and the manufacturing areas. Uh, so one of the key development areas is actually the Penang Bay. Yeah? One of the big, big key areas is in Penang Bay. And this is where the Georgetown area, this is the Georgetown heritage site on the left. And you can see this is the whole area that is up for rejuvenation. It's quite similar to your Marina Bay. And so a lot of investment for development is, is going to be around this area in the next basically 10 years. Right? At the top here, basically, is the reclamation and the journey walk. And basically, this is already completed reclamation for reclaimed land. And then basically we're looking at the rejuvenation of this Bay Area in Penang. And lots of uh, Singapore developers have already bought land on the mainland side. And if you know this is probably going to be like the Pukong side, and this is the PC in Shanghai. Right? So this is basically how uh, the development will evolve going forward. Uh, in this Georgetown area, basically that's where our office is sited. This will be an uh, innovation district of we call CD Square at Georgetown. Uh, this is basically uh, a, a brownfield site. So it's not as uh, easy as some of the states where they built from scratch, right? It's kind of built of a, a greenfield site. So they can imagine what the future is. But for us, we have to protect this because it's a heritage site. And so we have to evolve and look at what kind of technologies can we put in to rejuvenate this as a smart city, right? And so it's a very different challenges from a green fuel side. How do you protect that uh, heritage as well as then move it towards a digital uh, environment? So that's basically C square in terms of the uh, innovation district that we're looking at. So this will be designated as the innovation district and more like a living lab and you can look at putting in EV infrastructure as well. Now, going forward, uh, I mean, that's not just a plan. Uh, the plan is actually beyond 2030, and we're looking at into 2050. Into 2050, there are three reclaimed islands that are coming up. Uh, there, are, there are a few thousand hectares of land that's been reclaimed to the south of the island. And then there will be cable car links across from the island to the mainland as well. And so a lot of the development uh, in terms of the smart city, uh, there's a previous one, actually. It's 
called the uh, Batukawan, which is on the Banda Katsir, right? So on the mainland side, there's also another smart city, and that's probably more green hill, and that's going to be on this side of the uh, on the mainland itself. And then in the future, these are the three smart islands, and basically they will be designated for uh, future development. So this is basically Banda Kassia. This is the other Greenfield Smart City. So unlike the Georgetown here, which is a heritage site, it's probably easier to look at some of these uh, new estates. And this is more uh, a Greenfield site in Banda Kassia. So in summary, uh, the Penang State Government is a very pro business environment. Uh, since the 1970s, we have been pro manufacturing, and now we're moving into digital services. That's now we're looking for investment. The growth, a economic growth and development is not just for the short term into 2030, but it's going beyond that into 2050. What we're looking for is obviously a public-private partnership, looking for projects obviously in the green economy, uh, EV charging infrastructure, green vending machines, uh, future aquaculture, uh, urban farming, that kind of stuff. So, so definitely we're looking forward to proposals from uh, businesses uh, in terms of how we can uh, push forward and move into the digital economy. It is a lifestyle and a livable environment that we want to protect, obviously with the population and the size that we've got. And then we've got a deep talent pool, especially engineers and technology that can really uh, support some of this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. The two creative digital districts would definitely change the land, smart cities landscape in Penang and would be something for us to keep an eye on in the next few years. Be before we move on to our third speaker, we would like to invite you to take our second and final series of poll on Zoom. May I have the poll questions launched, please? For these sets of questions, we would like to find out more about your considerations when venturing into the Malaysian market. We are also curious about your readiness to look at foreign projects beyond your home market. Once again, the poll will be up for the next three minutes, so please fill it up at your convenience. Moving on to our third speaker. I'm happy to introduce Ms. Go Siok May, CEO of Grafico and Executive Director of United Cities. With more than 25 years of experience in the technology and telecommunications industry, Siok May currently leads Grafico, a software solutions provider for industries such as smart cities, environmental impact and, and assessment, and asset inspection of energy and communications infrastructure. Siokmi has a lot of first-hand experience in managing projects in Malaysia, and she will be sharing her insights on working in Malaysia and the key takeaways from one of her past projects, the P Pataling Jaya Digital Twin Project. Siokmi, please. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey. Okay. It is very apt that we have the poll just now about the opportunities and the considerations for a uh, Malaysian market. Uh, today, what I'm going to share with you is basically my uh, own experience working in and with Malaysia. I wear several hats as I do this presentation. The first hat is I'm the CEO of Grafico, which is a product and solution-based um, organization out of Singapore. Uh, I'm also founder and owner of Tacative, which is a services and consulting organization based in Malaysia. As well as I'm also a um, founder, board director for United Cities, which is a non-profit organization that helps cities achieve SDG um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So I'll start my presentation now. In Malaysia, there are actually four main industry uh, sectors. Uh, private sector, multinational, MNCs, uh, government-linked organizations, uh, plus plus, as in there are some organizations that are not government-linked, so-called, but they act like one. <laughs> and then there's also the government sector. So in these four um, main sectors, um, mainly our experience come from banking, CMB Bank, for example, second largest bank, uh, universities, um, private and public, um, insuring, uh, insurer, uh, Sun Life is the second largest uh, life insurer in the world, um, established in 1865. Uh, with MNCs, we work very closely with the ICT and manufacturing company, uh, Dell, Asia Pacific, 
based out of Penang, our project where we implemented for six countries um, here. Uh, Smart Modular, which is a manufacturing uh, organization. So like what Tony Abbey mentioned, yes, these are all manufacturing organizations. So our project was to implement a semi uh, services project basically in five countries. Uh, in terms of telecommunication, uh, we work very closely with uh, Telecom Malaysia for Unified Installation, Maxis, Penang Water Board, um, Energy Board as well. From a government standpoint, federal, we work with the uh, Income Tax Department and the Emergency uh, 999, which is the Emergency Response Centers. And at the local level, we work with city councils. So some of the key takeaways from each sector. From the private sector, a lot of it is actually regarding the value add that you can give and the think win-win. Uh, basically, for example, in the banking and the insurance sector, how we value add in terms of services is we provide remote services support, 724. At the same time, uh, think win-win for them is we also have a rebate program with the customers, uh, which means if at any point in time where we do not meet our service level agreement, they can deduct what they pay off us, up to zero. Um, the good part about working with private sector is it's a very fast cycle. Uh, procurement can take basically within maybe one to two months and foreign companies can bid the rent. In terms of um, multinational organizations, they are global organizations, for example, like Dell and Smart Modular, a lot more convincing to do. In terms of Dell, uh, not just we have to go through procurement uh, at the Penang um, company, we then have to go through procurement with India, which is the regional. And then finally, in the US, because there are six countries that, were, that we were implementing for. So it needs a lot more convincing, but at the same time, projects are larger and we can also be direct. In terms of government-linked organization, it's a longer sales cycle. There are many inter and intra department uh, dependent to each other. So for example, in Telecom uh, One, which is a tele telecom sales department, Telecom Malaysia, internally they have 11 departments. And at the same time, there are many other telecom subsidiaries that we have to work with. So good part is they usually provide longer term contracts uh, sometimes between three to five years and then it will just um, continue on and some tenders foreign companies can be direct so lastly is the government sector so government sector we definitely need a local partner to work with and the local partner has to be certified with ministry of finance and or ministry of finance with bumi putra status so today i'm going to talk about uh, pataling jaya and a city council in Petaling Jaya. So Petaling Jaya is a district within Selangor and Selangor has got like 6.57 million people. Petaling Jaya is about 100 kilometers square and this project is actually about us taking photographs using drone, converting the photographs into a digital replica or a digital twin of the whole Petaling Jaya city itself. So now the criteria for the project is it's a tender. It's a tender to do a prototype. Uh, so like what Maimuna mentioned earlier as well, it is like a demonstration kind of a project. So it's a small project and the tender is actually open for within three to a six month timeline. The criteria is the solution has to be on premise. It's a 2D map. Only local companies can bid and there is a need for an upfront security deposit. So. How do we do this? Who are we? We are a company that is not registered with the Ministry of Finance. We are a software as a service organization. We run our application on AWS cloud. Um, at the same time, uh, we are not 2D, we are 3D, uh, digital twin 3D. And not only digital 3D twin, we use photogrammetry, which means we use realistic photos um, to basically uh, create the digital twin for the city. So how do we bridge this? You know, uh, it is different, but we believe that we are able to deliver the project. In fact, I think we, we believe that we are able to do it within or be, within that time frame that was given and to be able to do it well. So strategy is we actually looked for a MOF registered um, Bumiputra status company. And this organization has been working with the Pataling Jaya City Council for some time, 
um, but not in the same uh, solution as what we provide. But they are existing partners to Petaling Jaya. And they were willing to work with us on this uh, prototype uh, three month uh, to six month duration. Secondly, we had to change and uh, to tweak our solution from being cloud based to on premise. So, because this is a city council and they want the data to be within their servers or their data center, we had to tweak that solution back. And we had to convince them why 3D is better and why 3D photogrammetry is better than 2D. So sometimes the mindset is, you know, 2D is sufficient, you know, why do I need something extra? Why are you giving me something extra? So that convincing has to be done. And of course, the next thing is we are a Singapore company and we decided to set up a Malaysian organization as well and open a bank account in Wingit. So some of the project learnings that we had from here. Make the project successful, the most important, um, like what Maimuna mentioned earlier, is actually people and partnership. We had to find the right partner that pays us on time. I mean, we are an organization, our cash flow is important, so we have to find a partner that, not just a good partner, but a good partner that pays us on time. Three months is what we expected to complete the project. Internally, we wanted to complete the project within two months. However, projects do get delayed, which means we have to have our people based in Malaysia with accommodation and expenses um, extra. And for us, because we use a drone to fly, uh, we are very dependent on the weather. Uh, so weather being very important factor for us. So when the weather is not good, we can't fly, so we can't do the project. Speed of the people working is different, especially during the movement control order, where some of the city council staff actually has no access to the systems. So many of them are um, working off their desktop. So whenever it's uh, MCO and they have to work from home, they have limited access um, to the system that, that they were working with us with. Process. Tender process is important and also vendor registration criteria and documentation is important. So to register as a vendor and to register with Ministry of Finance will take anything between one month up to four to five months. So when we were doing this project, we were thinking, you know, by the time we do register with Ministry of Finance and all that, the project is over. So that's why we decided to went on a partnership mode instead. And with the partnership mode, we needed to have legal documents um, that states the scope very clearly. Uh, because these partner for us are not familiar with our solutions. So when they're not familiar with the solutions, we have to state very clearly what is their scope of work and what is our scope of work. So that is very important. And lastly, of course, the strategies that we put in place. Yes, for the prototype, we partner. Uh, for phase two onwards, do we want to continue to partner? And then if it's only this partner or do we then extend to other partners? What do we do? So our internal strategy was setting up a Malaysian organization. And also the reason is because it is an on-premise solution. So we needed to have people on site to be able to do the upgrades and the support and the maintenance. So we needed to have Bahasa speaking staff as well because the, the IT people that are maintaining the servers and all that are more comfortable speaking in Bahasa than English. Although saying that, I think many of Malaysians can understand and speak English really well. And then lastly, of course, is um, a bit of a strategy on how to navigate through political agendas. So um, Malaysia has got change in government, I think, for the last couple of years. And we may have another one coming up soon in the next two years because election is in the next two years. So uh, we have to ensure that the project has to continue irregardless of whether there's a government change or whether the people in the city council change or whether the mayor change. So those are our project learnings. The key takeaways is 80% is actually the right partnership and the right time. 40% uh, is our own internal business model and strategies. How do we want to go to market in this um, new market uh, or emerging market, uh, look, how do we want to do it, you know? 20% um, is actually the solution itself, whether there's uh, enough credentials to convince the customers, whether you have international awards, for example, and are you willing to localize the solution? So localize the solution, like for us, we have to make our solution on-premise. So from cloud to on-premise instead of from 
on premise to cloud, which is the, the original thing. And of course, lastly, is the inspiration, the drive, the passion to make sure that you know we can go in and actually do this. So take away from uh, entering into a new market, it's actually a total effort of about 150%. So not 100%. So uh, lastly, I would like to thank you. Um, United Cities, it's set up to help cities achieve um, SDG goals. And uh, we are a non-profit organization. So we are very happy uh, if you can reach out to me anytime uh, to talk about how you want to look at partnership uh, to, into these different cities. So thank you. And uh, Jeffrey, back to you. Thank you, Sokmei. It is interesting that you have echoed Maimuna's point that having the right partners is key to delivering a successful project. Moving on to our final speaker for the afternoon. I'm happy to introduce Mr. B.K. Singha. B.K. is the founding director of Habitat Enviro, the vice chair of the Asia Pacific Network of the World Green Building Council, and the former CEO of Malaysia Green Building Council. He has over 30 years of experience in project management, green buildings, and ways to energy project development. And he is respected as a thought leader and mentor in many notable sustainable projects in Malaysia, Maldives, and Vietnam. Today, BK will be sharing on his experience of working with Malaysian innovators to digitalize food supply chain and the potential collaboration opportunities with Singapore companies on Malaysian projects. Singha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I must say thank you to Singapore Business Federation for inviting me for this exciting talk today. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you to the audience, all 219 of you. Uh, hope my talk will be useful to you. Uh, and lastly, to the members of the audience who find my talk completely uh, irrelevant to you, I apologize in advance. So how do I complete 34 slides in 15 minutes? Well, I skipped some. Um, the, you will notice that the slides that have got more words, I will talk less. And the ones with less words, vice versa. So here we go. We are a com combination of five people um, with an accumulated experience of about 100 years. Um, and uh, we would like to, I would like to um, I would like to introduce especially um, sorry sorry yeah our star um, Professor Dr. Ishwa interesting what just happened here I'm sorry about this. Uh, I should, yeah. yeah. Professor Dr. Ishwa um, is a Malaysian. Hey, the slides keep changing by itself. Has it got a mind of its own? Professor Dr. Ishwa is a Malaysian who studied in Punjab University, moved to the NUS, and then to Rockefeller University and took up position as Director of Molecular New, uh, Neuroendocrinology at Nippon Medical School in Tokyo for more than 15 years, actually. This is unprecedented in Japan, where culture is to promote rank and file rather than foreigners. Uh, he is currently Head of Medical Research in Monash, Kuala Lumpur, and he is part of our team. Um, so this is our logo, self-explanatory. Um, we talk a little bit about our strategic approach. Now, um, as we have no new inventions to show except for accelerated nature-based fish growth technology by Professor Ishwa, our strength lies in a com combination of tried and tested technologies with the introduction of IoT and AI developing into digital twins, which catalyzes our projects to achieve very efficient sweet spots, considering our current needs of climate change, global warming, and the pandemic resulting in, in increased uh, awareness of food security. And this is our forte. 
Um, please, uh, I would like to draw your attention on the orange words on every slide. They highlight um, what we do. Um, we focus on these three areas of food production, cow, buffalo, meat and milk, uh, pig and poultry meat, and their respective downstream industries due to the fact that we actually generate energy on the, from the farms. Uh, so downstream industries like cheese, uh, milk, uh, sorry, cheese and sausages from uh, pork, uh, something that we are looking at um, very seriously. Now, um, we, you can see that uh, this is our core slide and this is what we do all in one farm. And you can see that IoT AI to digital twins will be the gel uh, for all our factors. We, I will go to, through each one of them in a little bit more detail as I move along. Now this slide, I bring your attention to the inputs box. Um, you can see two and the output box, you can see four. Whereas when you compare it to this, our farm, uh, this one is a business as usual farm, and this one is habitat and viral influenced sustainable farm. You can see in inputs, there are four and in outputs, there are five. And if you look at them, they, uh, I won't read through all of them, but the first one is important because on the same land area, we double the number of heads and I'll explain how we can, how we do that. And in the, in the following points, you will see that um, we are heading close to carbon neutral farm and farm products, which is really difficult to, to do. Would we, will we be the first one in the world to have to produce carbon neutral milk or cheese? Well, certainly something we really aspire to do. Um, then if you look at how we run circularity through buffalo farms, uh, this is a buffalo farm example and this is a pig farm example. Um, you will find that in both the farms, we go from taking the waste of the animals out of it, we go to biogas and slurry, and biogas produces heat and power. We either use it internally for the farms or we export it, or, or um, sorry, not all, but it is, it is combined with solar energy on the cow pens or the pig pens. And then we have slurry coming out where we do the separation from solid and liquid and the solid could be exported or used for organic so it's organic certified fertilizer which can be used on organic farms which want to produce certified organically certified products from the liquid we use aerated wetlands uh, we get very high quality water we are able to rare fish the water from the fish is able to go to our hydroponic houses and we produce fodder for the buffaloes the fish can be exported and they can be very high value fish. Um, in the pig farms, a little bit different. We wouldn't like to export the fish, but we use the fish combined with our hydroponic fodder and some imported vitamins into uh, producing pig feed meal. And all the farms where we are taking the waste from for our biogas uh, consumes the food. So it's really, um, a nice example of how circular economy works. Now, um, what is the need for this? You will find that ever so often farms have got issues. They've got issues with uh, uh, smell. They got issues with uh, pathogenic pollution. They got issues with uh, water pollution, um, flies, for example. Um, as you can see, some of these newspaper cuttings are quite recent. And however, it says that we've been enduring the swine manure for over 40 years. So the answer is not there, even though the problem causing uh, huge issues have been there for a long time. Uh, together with the fact that we also need to look at our agriculture and food security. Um, along with our farms, we incorporate for global communication, transparency, and for investor purposes, uh, ESG principles and compliance to the UN SDGs. Here, our communications are clear, they are universal, and we hope to change 
the status of downtrodden farms facing fines and, and causing problems to ones that um, are really serving its purpose in our world today, in the world we live in, which is quite different from the world of yesterday. Now, um, in the green technologies that we apply, we carefully pick a suite of technologies. We enhance each of them to uh, be optimized to uh, using science-based inputs. Uh, we use IoT to monitor and control the operations. Uh, we Im and improve their collective operations to reach a very high viability model that addresses and achieves all the five, five Ps, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. And uh, strangely, peace here also refers to the stress-free conditions of the animals, enabling their production of higher quality, meaning higher nutritional value and high, higher quantity of products, meat or milk. Um, and in this way, we can find that um, we are shifting uh, what happens at farms currently here in Malaysia to the new genre. The, the substratum of our project is actually, uh, this slide will allude to, is really biomimicry at work. Um, and you can see the overlay and the glue I speak about from the left box where we derive all our data, we feed into our control center in the right box. There, data and trending gives rise to, AI, uh, to information that we can create into AI. We can then simulate all that information to see how we can do better. And when we arrive at a better uh, sweet spot than what is currently being practiced in the farms, we, ex we push that back to the farm and tweak the way we do things and continuously move back and forth uh, from the left box to the right box to make sure we have continuous improvement. Advanced logistics is very important. They, they must be IoT based because it will tell us which farm to collect from at what point of time so that we can smoothen our operations. Uh, in fact, if we get this right, it is the, move, the start point of our rest of our operations behaving well. Um, it's, a, it's a major milestone which we cross there. And then we also look at advanced biomethanization systems where we are able to take do small tweaks using latest technologies, add-ons to our system to produce more gas and or produce, uh, um, generate, the, the gas faster or produce higher quality uh, fertilizer. We then purify that gas, uh, liquefy it and see how to send it back to the farms um, for the use of the farmer. Now the farmer here has got double credit because he's not only stopping the use of fossil fuel based farms, but he's using fuel which is renewable uh, for which is generated by his own pigs or his own cows or his own chicken. Uh, we use, we use uh, a system called aerated wetlands uh, to, to mitigate water because we get a lot of water. Every farmer washes uh, the waste which comes out of pigs and cows, especially with water. And we collect a lot of water and we have ways to release this water to the drain. Uh, we, we mitigate it using natural systems in fact, we upcycle the water that is coming in and which will enable us to grow fish, prawns, or any other high, high value product, um, as well as plant growth. Uh, we also produce organic fertilizer, and I alluded to this as to how it can be used in certified organic farms. We combine biogas and solar so that during the day, use of biogas is slightly reduced and during the night, only biogas is used. Uh, this is a typical installation, as you can see. Um, and also, in a typical farm, we are we currently doing a pilot study. We found that in a five-acre plot, uh, where we have one-third of it using the cow farm activities and two-thirds to grow grass. Whereas in our system, we have successfully been able to double the number of heads 
from 150 to 200 on um, two thirds of that land. And on one third of that land, we hydroponically grow fodder. We have our biogas, we have our aerated wetlands. Um, and so we are able to change the land use and land, u- uh, land use into much more beneficial purposes. We, we find that uh, green finance now is uh, emerging, debt, bonds or suku. And so we interface with uh, these, these agencies to help us. Now, um, going in the way forward, and I'd like to emp- emphasize a little bit on this uh, slide, every existing farm that causes some sort of problems or issues, odor, flies, water, pathogenic air pollution, uh, can use this system. Our system increases flexibility of implementation in very remote places, as well as places close to urban conundrums. So we don't have a limitation as to where we can, where we can or where we should place our farms. Uh, we also have our first EIA approval from the Department of Environment for a pig farm biogas project. I think this is unheard of in any ca- in Muslim country around the world. We have managed to achieve it after chasing it down for eight years. Uh, we have government support and we are collaborating with them to endorse our thing, even to uh, collaborate with us in some sort of joint venture. Uh, investor interest is very high. They are very excited that this downtrodden trade can come up uh, to achieve such high standards and levels at international um, levels as well. And we get very strong support from the farming community. You will see in Penang, in a place called Kampong Selamat on the mainland, where there are 69 farms. You can zoom in to see that 65 of them have signed on with us to uh, proceed and explore and to implement this project. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you have gained from my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Singha. It is interesting how you have applied technology in your farm. This shows that we can all think out of the box to achieve better sustainability for much much of our traditional sector. Before we move on to our Q&A session, I would like to share the results from our second poll that was conducted just now. May I have the results from the second polling session, please? Thank you. Xiaomi, it seems that many of our audience feel that suitable project is their most important consideration when deciding to venture into the Malaysian market. Also, a fair bit, around 39% of them also feel that a trustable partner is just as important. So what would you take away from this? Totally agree, totally agree. Because the first thing, like for example, in Petaling Jaya, the first thing that we have to make sure that is there is that uh, there is a solution, uh, there is a market for your solution, sorry. Uh, so it, there has to be something that is there for, for us and there has to be something that is um, relevant and paid. So saying that good payment terms, credible paymaster is actually linked to a trustable partner. So like what I earlier mentioned, you know, you have to have a partner, not just a good trustable partner, but a partner who will pay you on time. Thank so you, yes, I t- totally agree with yeah. that book. Yeah. Thank you, Uh PK, so what was your experience then? I mean, how, how do you, what do you think about the poll questions? Which would have been your most important consideration? Um, yeah, so for, in my area, uh, I would think a suitable project. Now, this project, which I just spoke about, was never suitable until we made it suitable. Once we made it suitable, we were able to ra- chase down the approval. So I do think um, the suitable project is, is uh, very, very important, uh, top of the list. Uh, trustable partner, well, there are trustable mechanisms we can put in place, you know, um, checks and balance, etc. It's, it's, it is important because economic viability is the most important pillar of sustainability. Um, if we don't have economic viability, then we don't have anything to do, actually. Um, so I would also tend to agree with Shokme um, in, agree, in agreeing with the arrangement. As far as finance is concerned, once the project can appeal to the right audience, which is coming up with the finance, it is not an issue. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, BK. So following this, we'll move on to the Q&A session. So, um, Maimuna, we have a couple of uh, interesting questions for you from the Q&A. Yeah. Uh, we have someone who is asking, for the five local planning authorities that are working under the one set of rules governing all parts of Skanda, where would our audience be able to find these uh, planning guidelines on the web? Yeah, so, so actually, uh, maybe there are two places that perhaps you can try to Google, not try, but you can Google. One is for, if you're talking about Iskandar Malaysia Planning Guidelines, you can actually Google what we call Comprehensive Development Plan 2. There's an italic number two at the back because it's that document that you want to look at. So that will give uh, you the direction of how Iskandar Malaysia wants to move forward, what are important, what needs to be focused and so forth. But if you are talking about smart city uh, for uh, some of the uh, projects or program, you actually can Google Malaysia smart city framework. The word KPKT needs to be at the back. So from there, you can actually download two important documents. One is the Malaysia smart city framework. But there is another document that we recently launched. So that book is actually Smart City Handbook for Malaysia. And, and that book actually been prepared by our uh, UK uh, ambassador, embassy in Malaysia. But it will give you a good insight of uh, what Istana Malaysia is doing, what uh, cities like Malacca is doing. So it gives a good insight of what are the key challenges uh, in Malaysia itself. So download those three documents so that you can really understand what's going on in Malaysia. Yeah. Thank you, Maimona. So uh, we have someone asking also, is um, RRDA able to export your capabilities to other um, cities within ACSN? And what would be your preferred model of engagement? <laughs> yeah, I guess, uh, I, I think, um, you know, uh, I've actually involved in, in many um, programs actually led by uh, Singapore as well, and also in the ASEAN. But I guess uh, I, I, we can actually have uh, other cities in ASEAN under ASEAN. And the best is actually maybe to utilize our Smart City 101 training because we already have the module and we actually know how to actually tackle some of the urban challenges faced uh, within uh, all cities in, in the ASEAN program. There are 26 cities altogether. And that program is actually uh, Standard Malaysia collaboration with the Smart Cities Network. So I guess that would be the best way to move forward. Yeah. Thank you, Maimona. So lastly, someone also asked, right? Um, could you share what are the areas of focus in sustainability and smart cities for each of the region in Malaysia? Yeah, so, so if you are able to download the Malaysia Smart City Framework, uh, there's one chapter, chapter nine, that actually outlines the challenges, the focus of that four cities. I mean, if you understand the geographical of Malaysia, you can see that two cities are in uh, Sarawak as well as Sabah. So they are on that region. And two cities actually in the main uh, peninsula, which is Kuala Lumpur and Johor Bahru. And I think today we also heard from Penang. So that will cover the whole region in Malaysia. So download that uh, framework, chapter nine. You should be able to see what will be the focus. Thank you, Maimona. So speaking of Penang, Tony, I have a question here for you. So what are the mobility challenges relating to in intra-travel within Penang Island and movement between Penang and the mainland? Uh, okay, so uh, most of the factories are on the mainland. Obviously, there's a daily commute issue. Uh, people living on the island going onto the mainland. Uh, so the usual traffic flows of uh, uh, going from island to mainland. And, uh, and the bridge, right? The first bridge is typically shorter, and so it's a lot more jammed up than the second bridge, which takes a lot longer. Uh, and and, and uh, I guess people tend to not use the, the bridge, um, that's the first one. Uh, the second thing is that we don't have a PIE, we don't have a Penn Island Expressway like Singapore. 
And this is actually part of the whole plan of retaining the islands and then investing in some of the road infrastructure. Uh, it is also what is in this, uh, the plan towards uh, the main service system right, into uh, the future. Uh, there are also plans to set up a water taxi so to various points between the heritage area and also into some of the industrial areas uh, into uh, on the mainland side. So the plan to set up water taxi around the whole island as well as to the mainland, that's just also in the pipeline. Uh, obviously, a lot of this plan to be uh, public private uh, partnership because uh, we're looking for entrepreneurs to come and set up and invest and things like that. So, so that's, that's basically some of the things. And also because of COVID, uh, I think traffic flows are now very light. So we have a project to actually look at simulating this uh, traffic pattern, but uh, because of COVID, uh, everything is all very light traffic now. Thank you, Tony. So could you uh, elaborate a rough timeline of the smart city projects uh, that PNAC is looking at currently and uh, which would be the uh, priority projects? Uh, definitely in the next, by 2030, right? So from now to 2030, over the next uh, eight years, definitely those are priority projects. Uh, mostly will be in infrastructure, digital infrastructure. So uh, that will be the key thing that we need to put in place. Um, and then there will be projects. I mean, we have already got CCTV networks, uh, sensor networks and stuff already, but uh, it's a question of pulling some of these things together, a strategy to pull it together. Uh, even a, a digital twin stuff that being done, but it's not being used, right? So it's about getting uh, it being used by the, uh, the authorities. Uh, the key projects will definitely be things like uh, uh, green economy stuff, uh, reducing the carbon footprint. Uh, EV charging infrastructure is definitely one we're looking at. Uh, green vending machines, I mean, I see some of these things already been done in Singapore. Uh, also aquaculture. Uh, because we are reclaiming some of the South Islands, which is about uh, contribute 5% of the fishery. And so how do we now go into uh, aquaculture, maybe uh, using uh, buildings instead of uh, uh, the sea itself. So some of these things are, are definitely in the pipeline. Most of our smart city projects are very concentrated on economic generation. Uh, so how does it contribute to economic generation rather than uh, you know, convenience uh, services, right? So that's most government delivery services, but it's primarily geared towards economic generation and investment attraction. Thank you, Tony. Um, so May, I have a question here for you. What is the, car yes. um, what is the current position of uh, ease of doing business in Malaysia for, for foreign companies, considering the uh, political instability? Um, I won't say Malaysia is politically unstable. I would say that Malaysia is politically changing and uh, change is the only constant. So in the four main sectors that I mentioned earlier, if you are targeting the private sector or the MNCs, it doesn't matter. Basically, they, they are agnostic to any political agendas and all that. We can just go direct, you know, talk to them direct and then you can just get your projects within a couple of months. No issues. If it is GLC, then we have to look at there will be some changes in terms of board of directors of the organization, but these are very large organizations like Telecom and Tanaga and very little impact to the project that you would want to do actually. So basically the people that you work with, the people that, that will carry your paper up for justification are the people that is still there and they are still working. So there is no difference. Uh, the only difference uh, that we have to basically look out for is mainly in the government sector. And in the government sector, if you're not bidding direct, it also doesn't matter because then you're working with partners who are bidding into the government agencies. And those partners, if they're agnostic, um, politically agnostic, it also doesn't matter. So basically, if you ask me, um, in terms of ease of doing business, um, the easiest is to actually go with that approach, basically, depending on which sector that you want to do. Yeah. Thank you, Xiaomi. So earlier you have shared about your journey with Graphico and working on the project in uh, Petaling Jaya. So how does setting up the uh, Singapore office help in dealing with uh, the Malaysian project? Um, a lot, actually. Uh, we started the project um, by getting a grant from IMDA. So thankfully, you know, IMDA believed in us. And from there, we worked with Capital Land. 
So one of the largest built environment property developer um, that gave us credibility. And then we work with uh, Smart Nation uh, that brought us to uh, Smart City Expo World Congress in Barcelona, where we were spotted by United Nation. So when we were spotted by United Nation, we became a partner to Organization for International Economic Relations. And that's how we got into partnership with United Nations. The other portion is um, thanks to KC, I think KC is in this call as well. Smart Cities Network, they have a wide reach in uh, multiple countries basically. Um, and we were in many events that were organized by KC. And one of them being uh, Smart Cities 101 training with Maimuna. So KC and Maimuna actually did the content and uh, the whole uh, program. Uh, I just sat in to be a facilitator to assist them in the workshop. So that gave us insight or gave me insight on working with uh, Malaysian, um, basically customers. Uh. Yeah. Thank you, Xiao Ming. Uh, BK, actually, I have a question here for you. So when you were sharing on your, um, your system for the farming, right? So what would be the greatest challenge to implement the system on a widespread basis in uh, Malaysia? Um, you know, uh Unfortunately, and it's not that I, I, I it's any um, thing negative that I'm saying, but it's a fact that uh, farmers in Malaysia, like in Indonesia and in Philippines and throughout the region, um, they, they are very traditional and they seem to be uh, uh, very averse to change. And as Chokme rightfully said, change, however, is the only constant. Mm, that is the challenge, the challenge in changing their mindset. Um, and we face that for a long time and very, very intensely. Finally, we came to find out that uh, things came together when green finance emerged. We came to find out that um, if we are able to remove their pain, pain of farming, which is people complaining about the flies and the smell and the water pollution, et cetera, et cetera, uh, without putting additional financial pain on them. Uh, for example, when we produce biogas, we, we use the bi biogas to produce electricity. But what we do is we talk to the farmers and say that we're going to sign a long-term contract to supply them this biogas and every kilowatt that comes out, we're going to charge them slightly cheaper than our main infrastructure company, TNB. And we are not going to change the price over the next 10 years, simply because we produce biogas from the waste coming out of their farms. Now, these sort of things are attractive to them to overcome these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, BK. Uh, Maimuna, I have uh, another question for, for, for you. So yes. earlier you have shared the ambitious plans that uh, our IRDA has to develop the region. So how would you suggest that Singapore companies can get involved? Yeah, I guess uh, we are very close to each other, right? Yeah, Johor Bahru <laughs> and Singapore. I guess uh, during this pandemic, uh, I have to say that everything is actually uh, become domain. <laughs> Uh, lock, lock down our boundary uh, but I think two ways that maybe we can look into it one is uh, perhaps uh, continuous those online marketing yeah and secondly uh, I would like to suggest that perhaps uh, you can get uh, Singapore government related agencies and and I think to organize uh, maybe a forum uh, maybe working together with Gilda uh, I would like to recommend that and maybe you can get in a Singapore Consulate a General Base in Johor. I guess you know Mr. Jivan Singh. So he's very close to us. Maybe you can ask him to actually organize that session. And then maybe there will be some opportunity. So maybe uh, this networking, I, I think that uh, it would be uh, good so that uh, maybe uh, the, the Singapore company can share what they have based on the challenges that I've actually mentioned just now. So perhaps, uh, yeah, reach out to your Singapore Consulate General for maybe uh, moving forward programs along with uh, Skandam. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Maimona. Um, so actually, we have a question here in a FAQ, uh, q and for you also. Um, someone, uh, we have someone that's asking, right, could you elaborate more on the role of the newly formed Malaysia Smart Cities Alliance Association? Okay, 
I did not mention that just now, right? <laughs> okay, Malaysia Smart City Alliance is uh, currently, uh, this is a new association. Uh, so we have actually uh, recently received uh, approval from uh, the, sec uh, the, the secretary to actually form this organization. So uh, MSCA is actually an industrial based uh, association to drive a smart city project in Malaysia. But unfortunately, currently we are focusing on our local solution provider to become members. And, and the objective is that perhaps with this association, then we can hear uh, what are the challenges that the industry have uh, for them to actually uh, work on smart city project. So it's a new association. Uh, and, and currently, like I mentioned, it would focus on Malaysia-based company first. Yeah. Um, thank you, Maimona. Uh, I have uh, one last question for Tony. Um, Tony, you have a wealth of experience in the digital space. So if you could look into your crystal ball, what would be your advice to SMEs in Singapore and Malaysia? What do you think are the areas that would have the best potential in the next five to 10 years? Uh, oh, wow, I don't have the crystal ball. <laughs> I think, uh, well, the, the thing is that the SMEs in Penang uh, mostly are in manufacturing, right? So quite a lot of them are in precision engineering and stuff like that. The one good thing is that a lot of them are near retirement age. Uh, so they are looking to exit the market. So I think it's a potential for Singapore SMEs to uh, use them as an entry into the market, probably uh, do a JV and maybe take over eventually. And so they, they have a good foothold of the customers already. Uh, so that may be one of them. And then to push them towards uh, digital transformation because uh, some of them are just not willing to get into the IR 4.0 stuff anymore because they are, they are like comfortable and uh, and they don't have a next generation to take over. Right? So that's a potential for, for SMB collaboration between the two countries. I think uh, that's an opportunity there. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we are coming to the end of our webinar today. So um, I would like to invite our, our, panel, our panelists to share with us your closing remark. Um, so if there's one thing you would like this audience to take away from this session, uh, what would it be? Um, BK? Thank you. Um, I would like the audience to think a little bit about where the food on the table comes from um, and also consider how we can ensure that it is completely safe. It, it has traceability, chain of custody. All this can be enabled through smart farming. Um, and also to be able to, uh, as you know, farming has got many negative effects on global warming and climate change. To be able to moderate our habits around smarter way of consumption, which will impact production. Thank you. Thank you, Singha. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Xiaomei now to give your closing remarks. Hi, thanks, Jeff. My closing remarks, um, two pointers. Basically, um, the first one is uh, to know your market, uh, to know what you can offer. Uh, like for us, we had to actually change our solution to go into a new market for it to become on-premise. Is that something that you're willing to do? Is something you need to consider? And secondly, in terms of partnership, uh, very importantly, a partnership strategy. It's not just a one-off working with this partner just because there's an opportunity working there. It's, it's actually longer term and that's how you can expand within the country. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Xiaomei. Um, Tony, would you like to share something with us? Uh, I think uh, you have the benefit of hindsight, actually, because uh, the trajectory Singapore has gone and it's probably economic-wise is maybe like, like uh, 20 years ahead now of Penang. Uh, given the size of where we are, you have that hindsight to see where we're going to be heading towards. And so uh, there's lots of uh, technology transfer and investments that you can look into how you can take us along that journey. Uh, that's one. And then obviously is... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the opportunities are there because we're looking at the long term. And then the other thing is obviously, how do we, how do you tap into uh, 
I mean, the market is very small. Even if you look at the Northern Corridor, the four states, we have only a population of 7 million. Uh, so basically, it's how do we use the infrastructure, uh, the, the environment, the talent pool, and how do you use that to supplement uh, what Singapore has to go into the region? Thank you, Tony. Um, and uh, last but not least, Maimuna, do you have uh, something to say to the audience? Uh, Maimuna, do you want to unmute? Yeah, yeah. So Malaysian <laughs> cities are actually eager to explore this smart cities project. And, and I think, please keep in mind, there are also many solution providers in Malaysia as well. But I think uh, the, the recipe that I mentioned just now, if you want to venture into a Malaysia um, market, you really need to, to understand and see if you can actually give that, that the recipe that I mentioned just now. So I guess good luck and actually looking forward to work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Maimuna. So on behalf of the uh, SBF and uh, SEN, we would like to thank Maimuna, Tony, Siokmei and BK for joining us today and sharing all your insights on smart cities initiatives in Malaysia. There are plenty of opportunities that Singapore companies could look to collaborate on with their Malaysian counterparts. Next up on our calendar, we will be organizing an exciting webinar for you on the 22nd of July. We will be having the third episode of our Sustainable Financing Awareness Series on Circular Economy. We will deep dive into topics such as plastic and e-waste recycling, so join us as we explore opportunities arising from the circular economy in the region. If you have any questions relating to venturing overseas, please reach out to Zichuan. If you would like to understand more about SBF Infrastructure Committee and the work that we deal with, please use your mobile phone to scan the first code to learn more about us. If you are interested to join our Infrastructure Interest Group, please scan the second QR code. This will bring you to an online forum where you may share more about yourself with us. We will then be able to keep you updated on infrastructure and sustainability development issues and projects opportunities regularly. Lastly, we would appreciate if you could take some time to fill out a short feedback survey form administered by Forbes Research by scanning the QR code on the screen with your mobile phone. This feedback survey should not take more than five minutes of your time. Your views are important and will help us improve our events in the future. Once again, my name is Jeffrey from the Singapore Business Federation, and I'm pleased to be your host for today. Thank you for staying with us for, for the last 90 minutes. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you again. Goodbye. <laughs>